Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the April 17, 2018 Special Committee of the Whole Meeting of the DeKalb City Council. Prior to uh, our roll call this evening, uh, I would like to uh, let folks know, our fellow City Council members and those of you who may be watching from home and our audience tonight, that uh, two of our aldermen, our uh, second ward, uh, or excuse me, our third ward alderman, Mark, Mike Marquardt, uh, and our seventh ward uh, alderman, uh, Tony Favor, will not be joining us this evening. Both of them have work-related obligations. Uh, we also have received a note from our second ward alderman, uh, Bill Finucan, that he will be uh, late this evening, but he uh, does plan on attending our uh, our session. Uh, with that being said, uh, and the fact that we do in fact have a quorum of our council, I would like to ask uh, our deputy city clerk, uh, Ruth Scott, to call the roll, please. Jacobson? Here. Finucan? Marquardt? Fagan? Here. Norico? Here. Verbeck? Here. Favor? Smith? Here. Five present? We have one consideration this evening, and that is the uh, budget uh, workshop. Actually, we're going to see a video and then uh, mm -hmm. have the workshop, the service level and line item review. Um, and during that time, we would welcome anyone in our audience to uh, make uh, a, a comment. Um, but at this point, we have the item on our agenda of public participation. If someone is registered to speak to an item not listed on the agenda, uh, we'd like them to come to the podium to do that. And Ruth, I don't believe we've had any speaker request forms no. given to us, so I'm going to assume that we have no public participation this evening. With that, I'll move it to item C under our agenda, and that is consideration number one, the basic budget video. Our finance director, Molly Talkington. Thank you, Mary. I'm a mayor. <laughs> um, tonight, we're going to uh, preview the budget basic video we put together for the city of DeKalb. This was in the schedule for the FY19 budget process that we went over back in January. And it's in an effort to try to reach <coughs> new residents in our city or more residents in our city through different platforms. So we'd anticipate putting this on the website, rolling it on Facebook, and trying to um, get more interest into the city budget. But also, it's on a, it's called Budget Basics to give kind of an overview of what it is we even do at the city and how we budget, and put it in less technical terms than we tend to talk about when we're here at City Council. So Byron, go ahead and play the video. At the City of DeKalb, we know you work hard for your money. To ensure the money you earn covers all your expenses, such as the mortgage or rent payment, groceries, gas, medical bills, and childcare, you probably stick to a budget. Using a budget allows you to cover all your bills and hopefully set a little bit aside to help with those unanticipated expenses that come up every now and then. City government is not much different. The City of DeKalb uses an annual budget to determine exactly how much we can afford to spend on providing services to our residents. In order to plan a balanced budget, we need to know how much money comes into the city. We call this revenue. From there, we can determine what we can spend on city services. We call those expenditures. While the principle is the same, our budget is slightly larger and more complex than the typical household budget, so we thought we'd show you how it all works. With a $93 million annual budget and over 200 hardworking employees, the city does a lot to make this community a great place to live, work, go to school, and do business. So let's see what it takes to make this all possible. First and foremost, the city provides services to ensure you and your family are safe. Our fire department offers fire protection and emergency medical services 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Firefighters are well equipped to respond to most any call for help from one of three fire stations located throughout the city. The police department also works around the clock to keep you, your family, and your property safe. 
day and night, officers are out in the community taking steps to prevent crime and enforce state and local laws. When a crime happens, our officers are there to thoroughly investigate and bring those responsible to justice. Getting to work or school on time is important, so our Public Works Department is there to maintain DeKalb's 130 miles of road. From snow removal to major road construction and everything in between, Public Works is responsible for all of the city's infrastructure. This includes the city's water system, which provides a clean, reliable source of drinking water to residents of the city. Public Works is also responsible for maintaining the city's fleet of approximately 170 vehicles, which includes everything from dump trucks to police cars. But that's not all. Did you know that DeKalb has its own airport? Public Works is also responsible for the operation of DeKalb Taylor Municipal Airport, a full-service airport offering refueling, de-icing, and cargo handling services for private and corporate air traffic. The city also helps coordinate and fund mass transit in the DeKalb area through the Voluntary Action Center, better known as TransVac. Planning is currently underway for a consolidation of this bus service with Northern Illinois University's Husky Bus Line, which will better serve students and residents. Community development is responsible for bringing new investments to the city through its economic development efforts. Bringing new development to the city creates job opportunities for our residents and increased tax revenues to pay for city services. The building division is responsible for ensuring that residential and commercial construction is built according to established codes. Once built, properties must be well maintained to support a vibrant community and our code compliance inspectors are there to make sure of that. In addition, community development provides assistance to residents in need through various grant-funded programs and partner agencies. This is just some of what we do to make DeKalb the place you call home. The services we provide are a return on the investment you make through property and sales taxes and other fees paid to the city. Because you play such an important part in the process, we think it's important for you to understand how your contributions are allocated in our annual budget process. The city's finances are divided into several different funds. Money flows into those funds from a number of revenue sources. Local property taxes are one source of revenue. But did you know that only 9% of your property tax bill goes to the city? The general fund is used to run most of our daily operations. Dollars in the general fund come from a number of different sources, including 42% from sales taxes, 16% from property taxes, 13% from intergovernmental revenue, which comes from the city's share of various state taxes along with state and federal grants, and 10% from franchise and utility taxes. The remainder comes from various service charges, license and permit fees, and fines. General fund revenues are dispersed into the operating budgets of city departments with the majority funding police and fire department operations, followed by public works and community development departments. The city also operates several enterprise funds in which revenue generated goes directly toward the service provided. For example, the water fund pays for the supply, treatment, storage, and distribution of the city's portable water system, which provides an excess of 1.1 billion gallons of water annually to DeKalb residents. The water-related enterprise funds generate $7.25 million in revenues annually. Currently, the water-related funds are self-sufficient. The airport fund, which is another enterprise fund, generates $1.2 million in revenues. Starting in fiscal year 2017, a new fuel pricing strategy was implemented, which is producing increased fuel sales. The strategy is to have the lowest cost per volume, which has increased the number of air traffic stops. As the fiscal agent for TransVac, the city maintains a transportation fund. Included in this fund are transit services, 65% of which are funded through federal grants. The local share to fund mass transit is approximately $1.5 million. Capital projects funds pay for the upkeep of major items, like the city's roads, public facilities, and vehicle fleet. Included in the capital projects funds are two tax increment financing funds, which fund redevelopment projects in the city's two TIF districts. With the expiration of both TIFs approaching within the next four years, a TIF phase-out team was formed in fiscal year 14. 
This team will identify highly transformative projects for completion with the remaining funds. Fiscal year 2018 budgeted expenditures total $11.3 million and include several projects associated with downtown DeKalb restoration. Beginning in fiscal year 18, the Capital Projects Fund has a dedicated revenue source for street maintenance through a two cent per gallon increase and the local motor fuel tax rate for a total of four cents per gallon. With the two cent per gallon increase and other sources, the revenues for fiscal year 18 total $1.3 million. This fund accounts for capital improvements to the city streets and sidewalks. The city also maintains police and fire pension funds. Expenditures from these funds pay for retiree pensions, financial management fees, audit costs, and other miscellaneous items as governed by the Illinois State Statute. Revenue sources come primarily from property taxes, investment earnings, and withholdings from payroll checks of active fire and police department personnel. The employee contributions are 9.91% of regular police salaries and 9.46% of regular fire salaries. By state law, these pension funds must be 90% funded by the year 2040. Current funding levels for the Police Pension Fund and the Fire Pension Fund are 50.4% and 40.5%, with 22 years to get these balances up to 90%. We know this can sound a little complex, but we hope you now have a better understanding of how your hard-earned money helps provide the city services you rely on every day. We invite you to learn more by visiting the city's website. You can follow along with the fiscal year 2019 budget process by attending city council and finance advisory committee meetings throughout 2018. So that's the video we have. Um, as you can see, you could probably break it into two if you want to use it for different avenues. Um, you know, the part that really focuses on services, the first half, and then the budget is really the second half. But we want to try to roll it out as one video and to grab more of our city audience in a different way than we typically do with budgets. Other than educating us, what, how do you see utilizing this video? So I would see it on like the city's website, on Facebook. We could put it on the public channel to try to get more people interested. Hopefully, like on Facebook, you'd get a click, someone would share it, and it would maybe reach um, more residents than we typically reach with the avenues that we're using for budget now, which tend to mainly be our city council meetings and finance advisory meetings, and not everyone comes to those meetings. So and this might be a nice thing for our aldermen to consider uh, if, in fact, you have uh, ward meetings, mm -hmm. uh, especially mm -hmm. since we're going through this budget process now, and certainly it's a kind of thing that service clubs are always looking for programs, and this would be a good way to, to do that. I think, I think uh, technically, it, it's very well done. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Jerry. Any other comments? Uh, Alderman Oreco. <laughs> I can't believe you actually made budgets interesting. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it was much better than I would have anticipated. I was expecting to see, pardon the expression, talking heads or something. And I mean, it was um, informative but clever, and it was really well done. Yeah, that, thank you, because we really wanted to stay away from those technical terms we mm -hmm. focus so much on when we're here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it can be very useful. Thank you. That's good. Were you waiting for me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> any, any other comments? Uh, once in a while, that's something that we have to take. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I had to do that. Um, okay, let's move right along then to our budget workshop, uh, service level and line item review. Our community development uh, department is what we're looking at uh, this evening. 
and we're going to ask our community development director Joe Ellen Charlton to speak to this item Joe Ellen thank you mayor and council 10 minutes to get through everything we do is a real challenge but I'm going to try my best to get through that um, luckily you have a report that details most of that information that we mm -hmm. wanted you to see we spent a lot of time with our staff putting that together and it's a really good snapshot if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it or if those at home haven't uh, it does really go through in detail a large part of what we do there's still some other things that come up on a day-to-day -day basis that um, we still respond to when requested to but I think that's a fair representation of our daily responsibilities um, my presentation is going to step through basically four components. Uh, I'm going to talk about the primary functions of the Community Development Department. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about why that's important. What service does that provide to the community? Uh, thirdly, I'm going to step through quickly what the services within each one of those functions are so you have an understanding. Uh, again, those are more detailed in the report, but I'll step through some of those very quickly. And then finally, I know this uh, Council spent a lot of time talking about goals and came up with 10 goals that you are hopeful the city uh, departments can accomplish this year. So I'm going to go through uh, one or more of those goals and how our department will play a role in those for the, for the council. So our primary functions within the department are depicted on the graph that you see on the screen. Uh, at the center of the graph are the comprehensive and sub-area plans guiding development. Uh, as you know, most of those plans, our, our uh, comprehensive plan is pretty old, but given that a lot of our development is focused in the central area and areas that are already approved, we can focus our areas on those. Once we want to start expanding, we're really going to need to more seriously look at updating that comprehensive plan uh, a little bit more seriously. Uh, the sub-area plan, Annie Glidden North, is an example of a sub-area plan that we can adopt into the comprehensive plan, and that is also a tool that we intend on using. So that whole center thing, so your council policy direction and those comprehensive plans really guide everything that we do within the department. At the top, we, we start with economic development. So our department is really a process of get them in, economic development. Zoning and plan approval is get them approved. Uh, kind of moving down clockwise through the graph, construction permits and inspections is get them built and get them inspected and get them occupied. At the bottom of the chart, we have code compliance and crime-free housing. That's once it's here, let's take care of it, make sure it's safe, make sure the investment is protected and that people can expect uh, their property values to be maintained in the area. Our department is also the, uh, uh, has oversight of the social service services that are provided to our residents. So for those people that are in need, we have specific programs that are funded through HUD, through the Community Development Block Grant Program uh, to provide those services. And then finally, as many other departments do, we find ourselves working with other departments in an interdepartmental support role. And I'll go through some of those uh, in a little bit more detail in the presentation. The purpose of our department is really to guide responsible development, uh, increase our EAV, increase the tax base, because at the, end of the, at the end of the day, we really want the city to be able to provide all of the services that the residents expect, and we hope to do it at, at tax rates that are less than we're at today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides. So the mayor always says we want to be laser focused on economic development. So why, why, why is that? What does that do for the city? We talk about equalized assessed values and this graph shows the trend of equalized assessed values over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, you can see in those first years in the graph where the upward trend occurs, that's from 2004 to 2008. Those are pretty good times. I mean, I think people in DeKalb can talk about that time in history as being very profitable, very, a very good time in the history of DeKalb. From that point forward to probably 14, 15, even today, people are still feeling the ill effects of the recession that hit in the 2008, 2009 time period. And you can see that downward decline reflected in those assessed values. The good news is that that trend stopped between 2014 and 2015, at least in the 2016 area, we saw those increases. We don't yet have 2017 data from the county, but we do expect to see a slight increase. So that trend is moving in the right direction 
and as the next graph will show uh, why that's important um, to our taxpayers. So what, what impact does an improved EAV have on the taxes that our residents paid? This is a pretty simplistic way to show that story. Um, so if you look at the, the second column or the first column of numbers, I'm going to step through a story here. So if all of the EAV in the community totaled $100 million, so that's the top number in that second column, and the sum of all the, the money that the government entity, so the city, the park, everybody asked for was $11 million. The way the tax rate is calculated is you take that, that levy or that request and divide it by the total amount of the EAV. And that gives you your tax rate. So 0.11, that's the 11, I think we've <coughs> seen 12% tax rates within our community. What's the impact of that on a $300,000 home? Well, a $300,000 home is assessed at virtually one-third or exactly one-third of its fair market value. So that would be $100,000. So that resident with a $300,000 home and an 11% tax rate would pay $11,000 in taxes. Now here's where the story gets good. That second column makes the assumption that if we could increase, so if the total amount of value in the community was $117 million instead of $100 million, that's an increase of 17% in the EAV. And that would be all the new construction. So the things that we're bringing to the community, the things that economic development is adding to our base EAV and growing our EAV. If we do that and you go through that same calculation, so everything else being equal, meaning that levy still $11 million, that person still has a $300,000 home assessed at a third, the tax rate is not 11% anymore, it's 9.4% now. And that tax paid by that particular owner would be $9,400, which is a 15% reduction in the taxes paid. So it's just a really good story. I, I want to, you know, people don't always understand what we say, what we mean when we are talking about increasing the EAV as a means to uh, support the services that we do. So. Each one of those functions that I uh, talked about in that round chart at the beginning, I'm going to step through those very quickly. Uh, economic development services are geared towards promotion, getting them in to the community. So Jason, our economic development planner, spends a lot of time on network building, marketing and promotion, meeting with prospects. There are people that we meet with on a scheduled basis. There are people that walk in off the street and really need to have a conversation with somebody about either something they're thinking about, an issue they're having, or just wanting to grow within the community. Uh, so the role of that position and that function within the city is to be a promotional tool, tool for the community. Uh, that uh, division also works pretty heavily with the Tax Increment Finance District Administration, so anything TIF usually goes through uh, that function. It's also our research and analysis uh, section. So anytime my department or other departments need any specific research of data or financial analysis, we rely on them for that. Uh, contract management, also some of the events fall within here. Again, events are something that's an economic development tool. If we have a successful event uh, community, it brings more people to the community. It makes our businesses more successful. When you have more successful existing businesses, more businesses want to come and join that. So again, that's an important uh, function of that, of that role. As you'll see, um, in many of our divisions, we staff a lot of uh, commissions, committees, uh, various uh, groups. So uh, listed at the bottom, our economic development spends time with the EDC, our Economic Development Commission. We staff the Enhancement Commission. We also work with the uh, Egyptian Theater Board, the DCCBB, the Conventioner, Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, the DCEDC, our countywide economic development partner, uh, Proudly DeKalb, Downtown Merchants, and Business Coordination. So again, a really fast step through on economic development. Once we get them here, we need to get them approved. So that's our planning and zoning services. Again, a lot of people really need help, so they're scheduling meetings, submitting plans, walking in the door. Uh, the process uh, can be involved and extensive. It usually involves submittal of a lot of plans, 
that get distributed to, again, our partners. We have many partners that we work with outside of city government, and those partners include the park district and the sanitary district, all people and divisions that have interest in making sure that not only are we building it in compliance with our codes, but we're also building it in compliance with their codes and requirements. Uh, public hearings are handled by our Planning and Zoning Commission, and Dan, as you know, spends a lot of time up here presenting those to the council and preparing those ordinances and agreements and bringing that forward to you. That division also does a lot of the code, the UDO and code amendments, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit more as well. Uh, technically, that position also does a lot of the comprehensive planning. So every time we're doing projects that come forward that aren't consistent with our plan, we're kind of keeping a running tab of that so that we can come back with amendments to that at the right time. Uh, again, staff liaisons in that, in that function of the department are the Landmark Commission and the Planning and Zoning Commission. Construction plan review and inspection. So now we've got them approved. We need to review their building plans and get them constructed and inspected and occupied. Uh, so there's quite a few steps that go into that. The administrative folks downtown, downstairs, in addition to those standard functions, also take care of all the contractor registrations that we have. Uh, our department also handles all, all of the overweight vehicle permits that come in through the city. Uh, which, as you know, has been recently computerized and uh, has been a very successful program. Uh, also involved in a lot of meetings here. These meetings often involve going on site to visit with people to review their specific circumstances that are uh, present in their buildings and providing them with feedback and assistance and technical advice as to how they might more strategically or uh, might work to address a certain scenario. Uh, this division also gets uh, involved in a lot of emergency call-outs or can be involved along with our um, police and fire who are also involved in those situations. Uh, staff liaison to the Building Code Board of Appeals for this division. Code compliance also um, uh, under the Building Division Administration. Um, this division gets involved in a lot of our inspectional services and I've listed them all on the screen. So we do our commercial building inspection program through this division, rooming house inspections, fire life safety inspections, which look at all of the establishments that involve food or larger places of public assembly. So are some of our uh, entertainment accommodations. Gas station inspections are accommodated as our amusement establishments. Our property maintenance code is also uh, handled by our three part-time inspectors who uh, take complaints, uh, do drive-bys, and, and follow up on issues that neighbors call in to us and, and want the city to address uh, when people aren't following the various codes that we have on the books. Our crime-free housing services, uh, this is again geared towards keeping our neighborhoods nice and safe. Uh, there's registration. Um, uh, functions involved within this uh, service. Uh, he takes a look at all of the police reports and reviews on those and follows up with landlords when necessary. Uh, the, the key function of this is to identify and deal with chronic disorderly houses and do all of the documentation and have follow-up meetings as necessary. Also involves compliance agreements, working with our city attorney um, as necessary to, to work on those. One of the other things this division gets involved with quite extensively <coughs> both in the city and outside of the city is landlord training or other presentations to other towns who are looking to implement similar programs. So uh, Carl on occasion has gone to other areas to talk to them about how they might also implement a similar program in their community. <coughs> One very, uh, not, it's not completely unique, but it is the extent of social service uh, services that we provide to our residents and within our community in the city of DeKalb is very extensive and something I know both the city and the council are very proud of. Um, we work extensively with many different partners in the community who deliver these services. The council has routinely and consistently provided funding for these services. So the Human Service Grant Program that has uh, various entities receive grants to uh, <coughs> supplement their programs is handled and administered through this division. Uh, the primary function is the collection and distribution of the federally funded HUD program for community development block grant dollars. 
And those dollars go to things like funding our streets. We have street projects. We have uh, housing rehab projects. And other social services are also funding through this program. Uh, this division also is involved in certain aspects of emergency assistance when necessary. Um, and excuse me, uh, in this particular past year, this person was instrumental in working with us on the Annie Glidden North Technical Support uh, Plan. So she's been a part of that, as well as the University Village. So that thing that we presented to the council a couple of weeks ago to implement the uh, social service delivery program. Uh, we were also able to use Joanne Rouse's services on that pretty extensively. Those interdepartmental support services that I mentioned uh, were very involved in NIU student leadership and the whole university activity uh, many people in our debar department get involved with. Uh, the university meetings, events, that's something that uh, our department of inherited and has been handling for the historical events that we've done over the years so as a result we're kind of being looked at to kind of champion some of the new events and i have some ideas to share with you on moving forward with your goal of kind of expanding that and i'll get to that in a little bit uh, we also work with other departments on some of the press releases the city manager's office uh, works with us to do press releases that relate to community development we help them respond to their FOIA requests. Uh, we do special project research for the finance department at times when it's needed, and some of that statistical analysis I mentioned earlier. So our goals. Um, I have one slide for that. I've kind of pulled out the goals that you identified in your goal setting session that I felt were uh, applicable to our department, and I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about those. Uh, create the first on the short-term goal is to create a business friendly municipal code and UDO um, as I mentioned earlier Dan and in, in the planning and zoning uh, division kind of takes care of that currently on an as-needed basis so every time somebody comes forward and they have a project that requires any amendments that's something that we've processed in that fashion um, moving forward with whole scale Re uh, revisions to the code in my opinion I need to speak with all of you I know I've talked to a couple of people about what business friendly means to you and depending on who I talk to I get a slightly different answer updating a code is a very time labor intensive process so if we're going to go through that and have the public hearing with the Planning and Zoning Commission and you know draft all the ordinances agreements I want to make sure that we're addressing the right concerns so what I'm proposing to do in the fall when, when construction isn't quite as busy is come forward to a committee of the whole and talk to you specifically about you know, where we want to focus those revisions. So that's something that I would like to do uh, moving forward on that short-term goal. Um, airport um, strategy and kind of support was listed as one of your goals. I think that's not something that we're directly involved with, but through economic development, we are actively engaged with people who are considering airport sites. So when those types of requests come through, we spend a lot of time working with them uh, potentially on their site plan, their design. It's within our TIF district, so technically it could also request TIF assistance. So we do spend some time working on airport pro projects. Uh, review city regulations and adapt to encourage more special events and festivals. Um, again, this is something that we've heard and, and we fully support um, that festivals and events are something that uh, bring more people to the community and help in our overall economic development. We're stretched pretty thin to kind of grow that really big, so we've been trying to think outside the box on how we can do that with the resources that we have. Um, again, we have uh, interdepartmental uh, resources that we can tap. So I'm talking to uh, uh, Aaron Stevens in the city manager's office about potentially using him to kind of help us get this uh, program growing a little bit more and he can provide a little bit more stable uh, assistance and uh, stable uh, help as we need it moving forward with that goal. The last short-term goal that's listed is to work with NIU and to resolve AGN and Greek Row issues. We're heavily involved in that. That's, that's check. We're already doing that quite a bit. Uh, we meet with NIU regularly with the mayor and the community university meetings. Um, 
the AGN project is well underway. We had our most recent meeting last night. Uh, it was a community meeting. And uh, the consultant is uh, still expecting and on track to complete the project this summer. So we do look forward to receiving those recommendations and then sitting down with the community and deciding what the next implementation steps are. Greek row issues are also part of that plan, but they're also involved, we're also involved with um, the Greeks in the Greek sprinkler uh, requirements that I know we've talked to you a little bit and that will be coming forward very shortly. A couple of long-term goals I want to hit. Uh, thinking outside the box in terms of growth and rooftops and specifically I think what I heard your comments when I listened to the tape was that uh, in addition to the downtown what can we do in some of the areas either outside of the downtown or targeted towards some of the smaller um, developments within the downtown. So we are uh, working with a couple of you on some ideas that we have to target um, TIF resources to something other than that big transformational project in the downtown and we can have conversations about that fairly shortly. In terms of areas outside of the downtown, we're also pretty actively involved. The Chicago West Business Park on the south side of town is, and, and Park 88 are two of our larger business parks that are already approved and pretty shovel ready for development. So. Uh, we are spending time with both of those groups to see what we can do and thinking outside the box to get something rolling on that sooner rather than later. With regard to rooftops, same thing. Um, most of you know that we've uh, waived our impact fees, we've had a lot of conversations um, and still things aren't happening very quickly or as quickly as we would like them. So we have worked with the business coordination group and talked to some people and really hope um, that we're on target to uh, talk to some national home builders about seeing if it's possible that they could come in and do uh, finished developments that are already platted. Uh, that would allow us to take advantage of the uh, waiver of the impact fees that you and the sanitary district and the school district have all worked together to offer our developers. So again, I think that's something that we're hopeful will produce some results this year. And finally, reduce crime and be viewed as safe. Um, again, this, this isn't our primary responsibility, but our actions working on the Annie Glidden North project and any economic development effort that brings new jobs to the community that we can offer to residents who may not have access to jobs and employment and some of those other stabilizing forces is a very important part of that. The last slide, and I've kind of talked through all of the um, positions and the people within those positions, but uh, this is a representation of the positions and people within our department. I did separate it by color, so the dark green colors are those people within the department who are exempt employees, and uh, you see a lot, and we, we spend a lot of time in the community. Um, the other uh, positions are either part-time, so the bluish color positions are the part-time positions that we have, so they're limited to only the number of hours that they're qualified for. Uh, we, can't, we can't ask them to stay a little bit longer because then we would have to offer them benefits and other things, so um, it is a little bit different. It's a different way of managing people and at the end of the day when, when they've accomplished what they can in that time frame, they go home. The other uh, uh, color in there are our hourly rate people. So um, again, we do have the ability, those are the positions that we budget overtime for. They're full-time staff, but they work a 40-hour week and any time we go above that 40-hour, we're required to show the overtime budgets uh, within those positions. So I don't know how close I was to 10 minutes, but that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions about that or the line item budgets that you are also provided. Okay, we'll open it up to comments, questions. Alderman Verbeek. Well, thank you very much. That was very informative. And uh, we, we mentioned our goals. Uh, what I'm interested in hearing is, do we have the staffing in place to accomplish those goals? And we talk about service levels or uh, could you identify where maybe we need some further staffing to be able to accomplish these things? So I think just over a short amount of time is to better determine, you know, do we have staffing to uh, follow what we're uh, seeing as goals among our council? 
Well, um, our, our strategy, after having heard several past conversations about limitations on staffing, has been to tell you what we can do with the resources that we have. Um, obviously, you know, we've tried to reach out to other departments and pull in those resources where we think that makes sense. We also have the capability currently to contract with outside resources. So um, one of the line items in the budget, for example, is HR Green. And if my staff is very busy and can't accommodate the type of turnaround that somebody expects, we can pull that resource in and, and have an additional payment for that. That's currently designed to be at the expense of the applicant so they can make that choice. You can choose to be moved forward or you can wait and you know kind of be serviced in the time frame that we have. The alternative of course is to hire additional staff people and if we were provided with that opportunity I certainly would evaluate that and determine where, where that resource would best be targeted for. Yes, yeah, very. I'm very interested in knowing, though, we've, we've laid out these goals. Well, if we don't believe we have the proper resources to accomplish them, then what is needed to accomplish them? And then how do we measure the results of that further investment, whether that's added investment or shifting resources from one area to another? So I don't, I really haven't prepared to no, talk okay. about yeah. um, I have some general thoughts about it um, and certainly I, I'd be happy to have more <coughs> conversation about that um, I think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head once you once you have access to more resources then you can deliver the service more efficiently more quickly you know certainly uh, the UDO updates if that is something that you want to have done right now um, that would that we can't do that right now you know we are too engaged with servicing the people that are coming in the door wanting to invest in our community to dedicate the resource to that um, there are probably alternatives to that that we could explore with you it, you know we could contract out for that we could hire somebody for that um, again whenever we hire we get into the whole timing of you know bringing people on board I don't know that any of those uh, hiring procedures would result in um, an immediate benefit just you know because it takes time and, and things so it, I think it's something we need to plan a little bit forward for yeah, yeah I th thank you yeah Alderman Fagan okay I'll, uh, I've got quite a few things just to go over real quickly mm -hmm. um, could you go back to the chart for the department showing right there We've got a little different one. It doesn't have the people's names. And I, 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 got it. I like yours better, though. It is a better chart. It has names. <laughs> it <laughs> yeah. does. We get to know yeah. what the titles are. Yeah. Anyway, um, I know that we switched over code compliance over to your department last mm -hmm. year. And so what we're looking at code compliance coordinator and the three part-time inspectors. Was there anything else that was brought into your department last year? The... Uh, Fire prevention officer, so to the left of there. So his inspections also do a lot of code compliance type of inspections. Um, I show him under Where's or to the left of, so it's called fire prevention. Green. Oh, okay. Right there. Okay, we've got, yeah. Uh -huh. we've got and technically, inspector. one note I want to make about that is technically a <coughs> dotted line to the fire chief because that's still a union position he is, he, he, under the that, fire chief right that's an expense comes out of the fire department yes I understand that. okay okay um under community development department code enforcement you know uh, back in 2016 well to th 2017 we had zero just code compliance is roughly five hundred sixty thousand dollars cost for that department that I'm on page 129 okay uh, okay so you're on the budget I'm on the budget section budget section line item budget right, right. okay it's the attachment page that
page 16 in the packet, though, right? There. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Oh. Right. I'm just looking at the what they gave us. Yeah, in the bottom. That's what I'm looking at, too. Okay. <coughs> so, your, I'm sorry, your question? My question is, then, what this is for community development code enforcement, we're talking about this, that the code compliance coordinator and the three part-time comes out, that total department, that total comes out to 560,000 at 559. So that also includes um, the chief building official um, that we hired this year, Thaddeus Mack. Thaddeus, okay. Uh huh. And the contractual, the, the remain, all of the expenses associated with that department as well. So prior to well, the reason you see zeros in all of the columns before that is it was either in another department. Right. or some of those services were covered under the admin budget of the community development so um, this line these line items didn't exist like this in prior years there yeah, the numbers are getting skewed because you know the moving around and that right. brings me back to the mm -hmm. total uh, for the contractual services last year we didn't have anything in your department um, of this and now we've come and the year before it was 276 thousand and now this year it's only 11 thousand I'm just asking wh where that's so the contractual services for HR green were uh, designated by a three-year contract that began in 2016 okay um, those services were shown in the admin budgets in 16 and 17 so that would have been for plan review and inspections only so the role that the chief building official now serves fire okay. and inspectors uh, or I'm sorry the um, code compliance coordinator and the inspectors were in the uh, police department at that point okay. with the fire inspection in the fire department so we've kind of taken multiple departments so one of the things the council did approve in the last budget was to eliminate some of the um, uh, contractual services we have right. with HR green in favor of hiring an inspector because the amount of money that we were paying to that con yes yeah I I kind of threw the numbers back and forth and I kind of see that okay okay that's good so it's we're thinking right got it cool uh, next page under housing rehabilitation you know 2016 it was 2,000 2,200 last year was 25 almost 26 now it's 35,000 is that grant money or is that what is that that is uh, refunded grant money basically so it's money that we get from HUD and invest in housing rehab projects and those housing rehab projects are set up as a loan so that if you don't live out the terms of that loan right. and we need so we only we uh, prorate the amount that you'd have to pay back to us if we get revenue in that way it has to go into this account it goes back in mm -hmm. so it continues to grow a little bit but our the use of those funds is a little bit more restricted we are evaluating so with uh, Joanne now working with us a little bit more we're evaluating what other uses of those funds we might be able to put that money to mm -hmm. um, we believe that there was a prior use of that fund for a revolving loan program which would be a great you know little seed money to do those types of projects and continue to provide funding to that so so that is money we do have it's money that we're looking into as to what else we could do with it that we're not doing now. Okay. Uh, the next page, 184 under uh, permanent improvements, jumped from 7.4 to 8 million. And it looks like mostly under private property rehab development. Is this TIF money? This is TIF. This is TIF one. Never mind. I just answered. Myself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to let somebody else talk. Okay, uh, Alderman else. Jacobson. <coughs> Trying to understand the personnel numbers a little bit better, um, breaking it down on one of these sheets, where is the chief building official and the code compliance coordinator, where, where are they at in terms of staffing costs? Um, so they're in the building division budget. Are you looking like where the line item is? I'm looking at community development expenses for administration, personnel, and benefits. So they're in a separate um, division. So page through and go to the um, at least page six building division. I, yes. Four. So those uh, building and code enforcement division. Um, Expenses start about halfway down that page. Okay. 
and uh, the regular or full-time wages are shown in the first section so the chief building official the crime free yeah. housing coordinator it. it's See, broken got up. it okay it. thank you mm -hmm. any other comments or questions it, what I liked about this uh, Joe Allen is it would have been very easy to prepare this and even though it was very timely it's got to be it's a 2018 budget I thought under one of the goals and I had questioned you about this if you recall in in my office the other day and that is this this situation about using that word transformational projects and I had asked you when I uh, months ago almost a year ago about whether or not we couldn't use some of those TIF dollars for some of the smaller projects if you will downtown and and I like the way that you would fate uh, phrase that here where is it uh, recent events in the downtown area have raised questions as to whether the council should modify its policy about doing only the big ones and looking at the smaller ones and so I mean you're spot on there uh, the, the this this council I think especially in light of what happened with the Lord Stanley situation and all that uh, at least now I, th I think we can take a look at that and say hey maybe we need to modify that stance and uh, I don't know if there are any other comments regarding that particular arena but it certainly uh, hit home with me thank you yeah uh, Alderman hey, I just have a quick question some of my other questions have already been addressed or I had the opportunity to ask them um, this is a minor amount but I can't recall any specifics page 83 citizens enhancement projects five thousand dollars is that for some of the awards they give out or the the group has over the past few years done work that involved you know projects in the downtown or starting a an art walk or you know just oh, certain things okay. that okay. they come up with through their discussions and mm -hmm. so at that point they asked for a discretionary budget to be able to spend if there was something that that through their um, collaboration okay. they came up with okay so we, we put that thank small you, amount thank in there thank you for mm -hmm. refreshing yeah you know they've been working on mm -hmm. the art corridor they've been working mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. uh, painting the uh, fire plugs etc mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so taking some of of that money and and spearheading it towards I think our boards and commissions make sense you know it's tough to ask people to do things and only make recommendations when they don't real really realize mm -hmm. how much money uh, we may have to spend yeah Pat um, getting back over to Jerry what just want to touch on that be on page 105 under TIF 1 um, we've got fifth street st streetscape uh, <coughs> some of these projects that could come out of TIF, I noticed the steam's still in there. Very good question. So when we did these budgets mm -hmm. late last year, I don't, I'm, I don't recall what the timing was, but a lot of times these budgets are developed at a time when we're budgeting for things that are cr at that point tracking right. through the system. Um, TIF is a little unique because, you know, it could be that project, it could be another project. We, we try to have money in place to cover the things at that time. But it right. does provide us with resources then to fund different projects that might be current now right. um, or to respond to change in policy direction like you are talking about so um, certainly in uh, TIF 1 we would have uh, some availability to address those types of projects okay. that are technically already budgeted uh, with numbers okay I've got another one here on page 106 and this is on the detailed budget report and if I can find the line here and er, okay you've got TIF study for fifty thousand dollars that's the current eligibility study that we that the council approved to evaluate mm -hmm. the new downtown TIF the that's currently TIF. underway correct okay 
and that's it for me now. Okay. Any other comments? Jerry. It, uh, yes, Alderman Verbeek. And, and Jerry, to your, to your point about uh, Lord Stanley's downtown, it's how can we be more proactive and how can we provide better service, better communication, and perhaps it's a strategy with, with technologies, but better efficiencies in, in that case. But uh, so that's where I'm concerned where, again, to be laser focused on economic development and code compliance and those things, I, th that will take resources. So I'm, I'm very interested in what, how we could benefit from additional resources. Also back to the TIF, we have a line item for 500000 for land acquisition. Uh, is that still in thinking for a steam center or what, what was intended for those dollars and could they be parsed out for uh, a smaller uh, TIF qualifying project? Is, is that in TIF 1 or TIF 2? That's uh, back to page 184. 184. Which is out of uh, number 1, TIF 1. Two. Sorry. I'm not sure what the intent of the 500,000 was to acquire land. My page numbers are different. So 500,000, it's under... Um, That's on page 106. 106. It's on uh, page... On the, break, on the breakout. 184, uh, which is page 18 of the attachments. Um, yeah, so typically... Um, I think we would, in that particular case, probably did involve the property acquisition that we anticipated could have been associated with oh, STEAM. Um, so it could also involve property acquisition associated with any private development project. So again, at the time it meant one thing, moving forward it could be uh, addressing a project that's more current. But we do not see it as committed to anything right now. Right now, and I'm gonna look to Jason just to make sure, okay. Okay. That's and we don't necessarily spend everything that we budget, you know. Right, right. Uh, especially right. if it's no need to. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Alderman Jacobson. Again, in the vein of TIF expenditures, I have always certainly been along the vein of major projects and getting the most bang for the buck. I have recently reached out to Jerry and Joe Ellen, and obviously it was mentioned in the, in the backup here, that there is a pervasive thought, at least downtown, <coughs> that our TIF application program and our TIF eligibility is next to impossible for the little guy. And while I appreciate some of the things absolutely are going to have to be more proactive <coughs> in terms of what we're looking at and how we're focusing on some issues down there, again, just walking around over the last couple weeks to identify some some major issues that are going to be very costly issues are going to be very difficult for some of these property owners to swallow to identify some of the comments out there especially in in some of the discussion after lord stanley's not necessarily related to lord stanley's but just in the greater sense of the downtown business stock the belief is that we are only willing to incentivize large developers to tear down buildings and destroy the, the fabric of the history of the downtown. And again, taking a second look and stepping back from that, I understand why, again, we get the most bang for the buck for that. We get the best returns in doing it that way. But there are some projects I believe that we could see code and code compliance issues we could see some hard improvements in terms of long-term building use tuck pointing and even some of the windows for for green eligibility and those things that are rather expensive improvements and as a force multiplier as tiff is is coming near the end of at least this iteration of it to see that we could get four or five times our money to start cleaning up some of the facades of these buildings, to see the buildings directly next to some of the projects we've already incentivized that have had 
that don't look as nice and that don't look as visually appealing when you're coming in downtown, especially now when you have the shadow of this really nice building next door to you on your building. I think there's several business owners that are interested in updating facades and doing some exterior projects, fire escapes and accessibility and those things. I believe there are several owners downtown and their belief is the city is not willing to undertake those projects. And again, understanding what our eligibility has been, understanding what council has directed staff to do in terms of saying before you're eligible for TIF, we need an entire interior code assessment of your building. That scares people off. If, if you say, hey, I want to do a $30,000 project, and the city will give me four or 5000 for that project, and I'll eat the twenty five on the exterior or on code compliance or on any one of those things, to realize if an inspector comes in and finds something that may be worth much more than that that you won't be able to do that can be frustrating to a lot of the business owners down there. So, again, I, I think at some point very shortly here we should revisit some of our smaller project budgets and try to find a lump sum that we could fund maybe the first eight or ten projects of people that want to come forward and do some of these things and at the same time have our code enforcement officials focus on the downtown to try to get some compliance in these buildings to try to get them cleaned up to try to work with the owners not necessarily as owners always perceive code enforcement as the person that shows up with a really long list of things it's going to be really expensive but as a much more proactive effort, as a hand-in-hand -hand effort, saying not only do we want you to work on these things, but here's some, some seed funding to get some of these projects done. Again, that, that's a policy decision on our part. It's something we haven't necessarily done since I've been up here. And I have advocated against a lot of the soft projects, paint and awnings and those things over the years. Again, the hard projects, the code compliance stuff, the green eligibility stuff, those things, we have the funds. And while I appreciate we are getting some bang for the buck on the big projects, those downtown taxpayers have paid into that TIF, and they want the access to try to do multipliers on their properties, and I think we should at least consider that at this point. <coughs> Certainly would behoove the city council to have that discussion. Okay, any other comments? Mayor, can I recap what I've heard? Yes, I, I, I saw that note that you wanted Perfect. to recap the discussion prior to our uh, adjournment. Sure, so what I heard tonight, to add kind of what I was calling our parking lot list from the last meeting. So on that list from the last meeting, I have dues and subscriptions, training, car allowances to bring you back more information, which I intend to bring back on that June 19th meeting with fire and HR, so it gives us a little time to get you um, more valuable information with that. But I would add to that then after tonight for com um, community development to have kind of a resources review that we can bring back at that time as well. Then the policy direction for TIF, you want to consider some modifications. That I would not add to the June 19th meeting, but it could come back to um, a city council committee of the whole meeting at a later date. So I have that listed as another kind of to-do that comes out of this meeting. The other open-end question I have is we did place an IT review prior to you really looking at these reports. And based on some comments I heard last time where there were some questions on police, would you like to come back with place and IT for them just to go over attachment A and attachment B that you've been getting with the other departments at some other time? Or do you feel that what the meeting we had on police and IT covered kind of your questions that you had for those departments? Uh, yes, Alderman Fagan. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> because we didn't have that information before that we do now, um, I think it'd be important, but I think if you're looking at the time now, it's not going to take that much time because um, we're coming prepared. We've got stuff in front of us. So I would say, yeah, I would like to, and, and it's a, a, that's my opinion. But with that said, that if you wanted to do split up the IT and split up, split up the police so we'd have the COW before our council meeting, so we're not taking everybody's time in the middle of a week of a whatever 
that we can actually do it on a council meeting night um or on the may meeting it's public works finance and if you think police and it would be fairly short we could add it to that meeting because june will get too long by adding the parking lot but i can uh, i'll look into if it's possible to add it to yeah. may because i haven't talked to police or it to even see if they're available um or we can split it at one of your cow meetings like you had suggested all right alderman so we'll get jacobson back to you on that. I don't know what our upcoming schedule looks like. I know, obviously, we get the brief updates in the manager's report. My worry is in pushing that TIF discussion until June. By the time we got it on to act on it, it would be the end of June. By the time we got our applications, you're talking end of August, middle of September, and the realization of those projects getting underway before it gets cold is very limited. I mean, it would be in the late fall. I, if possible, I would like to move it up and see if, again, I don't think it's going to be a very long discussion. I, I think that there's going to be some support on council for it to discuss what what some of those guidance to staff will be. I'd like to see some of this stuff in place before the start of next school year. Again, we're, we're, we have all these events outside. We have Corn Fest in August. We have our downtown events. Egyptian has many events starting up at about that time i want to see them in place so when people come back it's cleaned up it looks nice the projects are underway or completed at that point again end of june i think pushes that scale back past that date so i don't know if it's possible to get it onto a cow before june end of april early may first meeting in may i don't know what our schedule looks like but if at all possible can we at least look into that the TIF one I didn't intend for it to be part of June we will look at the schedules and try to get it to you as soon as we can thank you appreciate it is that something I, I think yeah I mean I, I anticipate framing a discussion for you at a committee of the whole on what I think I've heard collectively from you about Good. some way that we could put together you know maybe this will be the program we do this year and we could modify it next year to address different issues or a different amount of money or different percentages so we'll put together what we think we're hearing and we'll present it at a, at a committee of the whole to try and get to the time yeah. you are talking about uh, and if excuse me bill but mm -hmm. it, you know if in fact we have been sending the wrong message if in fact that is true if in fact the perception is that we only take care of the big guys and the little guys don't get that mm -hmm. then fast tracking this hopefully sends a message that this council is prepared to take a look at how that that TIF is structured and so that we can perhaps have that discussion about helping the little guy yeah Bill I just wondering do we really need to go to a cow first and not just bring it to a regular council meeting that way if we would decide to move forward we, can we could save a couple of weeks mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. just a thought on my part because <coughs> you know I'd, I'd love to get it along with Dave I think we do need to pay more attention to some of the smaller projects and I haven't heard any dissent from the other end mm -hmm. and um, so maybe we could instead of going to a cow just bring it to council and we can talk it out and hash it out and mm -hmm. get it done and save a couple of weeks if I could I mean I'm, I'm happy to try to do that yeah. but I, I generally can the council provide some direction as to at least total amounts or I mean I, I my assumption is we want some skin in the game from the people who are involved mm -hmm. is that based on a percentage kind of like we did the facade improvement grant program uh, are you looking at exterior only so if you can give me some general sure. guidelines like I, that well, we in, in light of your request and I I could see you know we have a discussion account and then have it back to council two weeks later mm -hmm. or, or even same meeting or even the same Hash night or or even if we have it attach it to one of our special meetings and then go to the next council or something like that you know let's speed this process up as much as we can too I have a draft out to both Jerry and John that I will share individually to the council members and okay I certainly would appreciate any tweaks it was <coughs> an off the head sitting in the conference room discussion that Joellen and I had that I put down into writing again if if individual comments I'll spearhead that effort for the time be being if you have any individual comments I'd certainly be open and happy to to understand them yep. any other comments we have no one 
uh, indicating they wanted to speak to this item. Um, anything else, <coughs> Molly or Joellen? Okay. What I'd like to do then is to uh, ask for a recess for executive session of our city council. Uh, approval to hold an executive session to discuss personnel as provided for in 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C1 motion. So moved. Second. <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to uh, move into a recess for an executive session. Roll call. Jacobson? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Fagan? Yes. Norico? Yes. Verbeck? Yes. Smith? Yes. Six yes. We are in recess. Thank you. Executive conference room. Yeah, so try to keep it short. Mark, Clark.